And we have a lot to learn today, so I'll hand it over to Paula Crowley, who will introduce our session today. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Julianne, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to space. Um, I'm very excited uh, to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Franz Vanderdunk, who is one of the world's leading authorities on space law and policy. Uh, he's the holder of several prestigious awards in this area and is a world-renowned public speaker on the subject, having spoken at TEDx, uh, Pink, and TV shows. He's published the first Handbook of Space Law and the Advanced Introduction to Space Law and over 200 articles on issues of space law and policy. He's also editor of the renowned series Studies in Space Law and has given over 400 presentations internationally and has taught as a guest professor at over 30 universities worldwide. Dr. Vonderduck received his master's degree in modern history and doctorate in international space law from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. And he currently holds the Harvey and Susan Perlman alumni Othmer Chair of Space Law at the unique LLM program on space, cyber, and telecommunication law at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which currently has the only law college in the nation that offers an advanced law degree in space, cyber, and telecommunications law. Dr. Vonderdunk is also director of Black Holes BV Consultancy in Space Law and Policy based in Leiden. Uh, it's a company he formed in 2007 to accommodate the opportunities he saw emerging in the area of space law. He's also consulted with hundreds of clients all over the world coming from the governmental, intergovernmental, and private sectors. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Vonderdunk, whose talk today is Satellite Communications at the Nexus of Space Law and Telecom Law. Welcome. Yeah, well, thank you for that very extended and, and generous introduction. And, and hello from the Netherlands, where I'm sitting right now. Um, yes, to, to, today I'm going to talk about just part of space law, namely the part that focuses on satellite communications. And satellite communications, uh, and the law of satellite communications is a little bit like the law of the horse. Uh, as the famous saying goes, it's not like you have a single coherent monolithic body of law, which uh, you know you can dive into and then you know everything you need to know in the legal context uh, for operating a uh, satellite communication service. Uh, it is actually a, uh, an area where several regimes overlap. And in the title, you see the two most important ones reflected, space law and telecommunications law. But in addition, I will uh, already tell you there is a third one, which I'm going to briefly address as well. Uh, and, and you can even expand that if you will. I'm not going to talk about intellectual property rights law, even though that is very important for satellite communications as well. Now, not knowing exactly how well versed you are in, in, in this particular field, I thought I'd give you a, you know, a very brief history. Uh, and satellite communications essentially starts in terms of the practical applications in 1965. Uh, of course, the first US and Soviet space missions, uh, whether manned or unmanned, used radio waves um, for, for uh, uh, connecting with the, uh, with the oper operating space object. But early BERT in 1965 satellite was the first proof that satellites could actually be used to comprise uh, a, a key element in the infrastructure of a, of a communication system. As a matter of fact, Arthur Clarke, a famous scientist, already a few years after the Second World War, um, discovered, so to speak, that if you would place three satellites in a very uh, smart position in the geostationary orbit, which is the orbit around the crater at about 36,000 kilometers altitude, with three satellites, you could basically provide a global network where everyone everywhere in the world, supposing they had the right type of receivers or transmitters, could use the satellites to communicate, communicate with everyone else. And sort of early bird was the proof of that. It was a US satellite uh, developed by, by NASA in conjunction with a statutory satellite operator created by federal statute in the US, which was CONSET, the Communication Satellite Corporation, which sort of gradually evolved into an international operation 
By 1971, the organization Intelsat, the International Telecommunications Satellite Organization, was established using as the nucleus the ComSat system, the US built system, but ultimately comprising close to 150 other countries of the world, all contributing their share to a massive network of dozens of satellites covering the whole world and being used for all sorts of telecommunication purposes. The success of Intelsat, of course, uh, begs people to follow that up. And a few years later, in Marsat, and here the MAR stands for Maritime, was established with a similar goal, only then not uh, for fixed satellite, land-based satellite communications, but of course, serving ships at sea. And as technology shrunk and shrunk and became more sophisticated, it was no longer simply or exclusively limited to maritime telecommunications. It also uh, was applicable to all mobile communications. And UTELSAT, I put it there as European, uh, it stands for the European Telecommunications Satellite, Satellite Organization. That sort of was a European version of UTELSAT, if you could do it. Um, around 2000, and that's a key area or era, I should say, in, in the history of satellite communications, um, it became clear for the first time, really, that it was actually an area where private, where private operators could make a lot of money. Um, they had already started 30 years earlier, but to some extent were all fledgling. And by the year 2000, they'd become so big that the actual intergovernmental operators, because InfoSat, InfoSat and UTOSAT were all intergovernmental organizations, were uh, no longer able to stand up against these lean, lean private operators. So they privatized, and that's why you don't see the new names in all caps anymore, but Intelsat, InnoSat, and UTOSAT in their private capacity are still among the major satellite operators today. And just to give you a, a brief indication, the total uh, worldwide market size uh, is, uh, is north of $70 billion annually. So we're really talking about big business here. And if we talk about satellite communications as an operational thing, we should realize that we talk about a system comprised of many elements, but the most important ones are the ground stations, whether they are fixed or mobile, the radio waves, which move back and forth from them through airspace and then also outer space when it comes to the satellites and the satellites orbiting outer space, which are on the one, on one hand, the key element of the whole system, on the other hand, they can't operate without the ground stations and the uh, radio waves. So uh, the idea is to uh, use these, uh, these infrastructure and the radio waves to relay messages and to provide broadcasts to everyone in the so-called footprint of a satellite. So it looks a little bit like that. I can show you if I want even more complicated pictures, but I think for the present purpose, this is complicated enough. It, it gives you an idea of how complex things can get. Uh, after this kind of very, very summary introduction, let's move to the law. The satellite communications law, as I said, finds itself on the nexus of space law, which is a body of law which also deals with launch vehicles, rockets, with the International Space Station, or with the moon, lunar resources, the plans of the United States to go back to the moon by the Artemis program. And then there's something called telecommunications law, which deals with the use of all sorts of devices for, for, uh, for telephone, and internet, and fax, television, and other broadcasting as part of that. And even though many of the telecommunications operators do not use satellites, but rather, as you can see here, uh, use something like cell towers, um, that is not applicable to satellite communications because that is, of course, where the two overlap. So when we talk about these systems, that's what we could call satellite communications law, even if we are, if should we remain aware that satellite communications law is not a coherent body of law, as I said before. Now, when I try to explain to non-lawyers how space law or law in general works, I'm always reminded of this heading um, of the New York Times of some 11 years ago, which read that wherever you go, the taxman goes. And of course, the idea is that wherever humans go, the taxman follows them in order to tax whatever they're doing. Well, it is my point that actually this should be the lawyer goes. Wherever humans go and undertake activities, that is where then lawyers start thinking about the legal aspects, the 
the, the proper requirements and rules for that. And this is, of course, no different for outer space law, which also means that the origins of space law can be easily traced back to this little thing. Sputnik 1, the Soviet satellite, which uh, circled the Earth in 1957 a number of times, and immediately gave rise to the first legal issue. Because if you think about it, uh, orbit, uh, sorry, Sputnik orbited a number of times also over the United States. And of course, in those days, the United States and the Soviet Union were locked in a Cold War, were afraid of each other's nuclear arsenal. And the, 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 the fundamental legal question was, is the Soviet Union entitled to fly a Soviet object over the United States at this altitude of, of considerably more than 100 kilometers without the United States being entitled to shot it to shoot it down. Uh, until then, we've seen a number of intrusions in other states' airspaces in airspace, and that was, that was clearly a fundamental rule prohibiting that, the sovereignty of states over their own national airspace. But the question was, how far does that extend upward? Does it include Sputnik? Or should we go for a different regime? Well, luckily, uh, in this area, the solutions came relatively quick. Within a year, the United Nations uh, became the, the major platform for the Soviet Union and the United States to discuss these legal issues. This gave rise to a first UN resolution on space, and UN resolutions as such are no binding law, but they provide a point on the horizon. They can become customary in international law. And in any event, within a few more years, the first binding international treaty was concluded, which inter alia for all, for once and for all, solved the question of whether the United States was allowed to shoot or had been allowed to shoot down Sputnik in 1957. It was already in, in fact solved by agreeing on a bilateral basis that this was not the case, that, that outer space indeed was a different realm, but that was kind of enshrined in this first treaty. The short name of the treaty is the Outer Space Treaty, but you also see the long name indicated here, the Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States. Uh, Paula made a remark in private companies earlier, just before we started. Uh, technically speaking, they are not mentioned here. I'll come back to that too. But on, of states in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. This Outer Space Treaty not ratified by the United States, by the Soviet Union, by China, by all important spacefaring nations. And as a consequence, the current tally is at 110 states, which is considerably more than half of the states of the world. Um, and since those involve all the major spacefaring nations, we can generally consider this to, cost, to constitute customary international law. Even a new coming state which has not signed or ratified the treaty yet, and could perhaps think about arguing, well, since I didn't sign the treaty, I'm not bound by its provisions, will have a very hard time in getting away with that, let me tell you that. Now, one issue with the Outer Space Treaty, given the time frame in, in, in which it was developed, developed, was that it had a clear focus on largely military and security issues, and a little bit to the side, the exploration and science, because those were the two main reasons why states would go to outer space in the first place. So there was no real concern for downstream applications, for commercial space activities. There was no private sector interested in flying anything in outer space because it was horribly expensive and horribly risky. Um, and that meant that now, today, we are stuck with some questions about how to adapt this regime to, uh, to the current situation. To some extent, adaptations were created by later treaties. In the, in the late 60s and early 70s, a few more treaties were signed, also generally with, with very broad approval and acceptance by the major spacefaring countries on specific um, uh, elements. What I would now propose to do is run you briefly through some of the key clauses of the outer space. The most important one, and that's why it's the one of the, perhaps the only one that I really quote in full, is reading outer space, including the moon, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty. In other words, the US was right in not considering Sputnik to fly through US 
sovereign airspace, but in a different area where no exercise jurisdiction. Outer space is what is sort of referenced, although it's not a, it's not a strictly legal term, but is referenced uh, to as a global commons, an international area. And if you just think about your history lessons back in the days, uh, of course, you, you, may have, you may recall that in particular Western European states had the habit of putting their flags in other parts of the world and thereby claiming these colonies for the motherland. Now, that is on earth prohibited ever since the UN Charter, which prohibited colonization and colonies and actually called for decolonization. Uh, but Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty basically means that this cannot apply in outer space as well. So the fact that US astronauts planted the flag of the moon in the Apollo missions from 1969 to 1972 was not meant and could never mean that the United States would claim the moon or the part thereof as part of its national territory. And the famous phrase runs a small step for a man. It should, of course, now be a human, but back in the days it was all about men. Uh, a small step for a man. It was a giant leap for mankind and not just for the United States. And, and both NASA and the astronauts and the US government went out of their way to make claim that they to make clear to the rest of the world that this flag was there to honor the US taxpayer, not to claim any territory for the United States. So, kind of following on from that, a second key clause is Article 1, which provides that the exploration and use is free for all states as a province of all mankind, but that's kind of this global commons idea. And the limits to those freedoms can therefore only result from international law. There's no single state which can prohibit another state unilaterally on doing anything in outer space. These, these limitations derive from international treaties only. Although I should add that states, as for the private sector, they could of course, uh, limit the possibilities for the private sector to enjoy the benefits of this freedom. The United States was a free enterprise state, so they were clearly uh, basically willing to allow private sector activities in outer space once it started to become a feasibility. But the Soviet Union, being a communist nation, didn't recognize private enterprise, certainly not in space, and so there was no private Soviet enterprise in space until the Soviet Union fell apart, basically, many years later. A third key clause, and this goes to this, uh, is now a very important clause because of the privatization of many space activities, because it reads that states are responsible for all national space activities, including if carried out by non-governmental entities, which is the term of art for private enterprise. So if SpaceX would somehow violate the rule of international law, it's the United States as a country which internationally can be held responsible. And for that reason, it is also required by Article 6 to make sure that SpaceX or any other private activities under its jurisdiction are properly authorized and supervised. So this gives rise to the phenomenon of national space law, which most importantly includes then a licensing system of private space activities to make sure that SpaceX, to continue in this example, doesn't do anything which the United States can be held accountable for by other states. So if we had more time, we could play fun with flags, but these are all the states which up to today have actually a national space law in place doing exactly that in different terms to different extents, as you can imagine, but they basically allow the private sector under a license or an authorization or a permit or whatever they call it to become active in outer space. You see big countries as obviously the United States, Canada, France, UK, even China is in there and Russia in 1993 following its, uh, its move away from communism. But you see also small countries like the United Arab Emirates or Luxembourg or New Zealand. And you see countries um, in, in areas of the world where you wouldn't expect them, perhaps like Brazil or Kazakhstan or Turkmenistan. And the list is growing. So that is uh, the tool by which states can control their own responsibility. And it goes actually even a step further because there's a kind of a twin article to Article 6, which is Article 7, which provides that states are also liable for damage caused by space objects, including private ones. So, we, and that is then elaborated 
by the liability convention, which provides one of these later treaties, which provides for some additional details, including absolute liability for damage on earth and unlimited compensation. And again, this means that to take again, again the space X example, if uh, unfortunately a space rocket, space X rocket crashes into Mexico City and causes a billion dollars of damage, the Mexican government needs to be reimbursed by the US government. And the US government can't say, oh no, no, you sue SpaceX in a private capacity to get your money back. No, it's the United States, which is liable, which again means that of course, only the licensing systems that we spoke about, uh, the United States includes how to deal with such unfortunate cases, namely to, uh, to derogate at least a first tier of that international liability to the licensee. And again, we can go to the same list of countries. Um, all of them have one way or another uh, dealt with this issue and provided for some form of derogation by a private licensee. Okay, now let's go back to, uh, oh, okay, this is the final article which brings, which bridges us to be, bring, creates a kind of bridge to telecommunications law because article three basically says that as a kind of a fallback clause, basically says that wherever space law is not sufficiently clear or not developed yet, we may have recourse to general international law, including the UN charter, but also, and this is important for Sputnik 1 and anything that follows from it, the use of radio frequencies in outer space. Because, you know, I'm hoping that this is going to work. This is what was happening. This is what Sputnik is doing. Sputnik was emitting a frequency. Now, as long as Sputnik was the only one emitting a frequency, and this is to all accounts not a very meaningful frequency, of course, there is no real problem. But to give you kind of a crash course in radio technology, uh, the terminology here is a frequency, which is in technical terms, the rate per second of a vibration of the air constituting a wave. And uh, you can have very high frequencies and very low frequencies. And they are usually expressed in vibrations per second or hertz. And you go up to something like gigahertz, where you talk about billions of hertzes at the same time. So very high frequencies. All these frequencies have one thing in common. If they are used in the same area by different services, interference results for both concerned. So there is a clear incentive for everyone interested in using these radio waves to make sure that no one else is using the radio wave in the same geographical area, because then both have a problem. With Sputnik, there was no problem because it was the first, but ever since then, that's changed. That brings us to the field of telecommunications law, which I should warn was a type of law which already existed at the national level, addressing wired as, as much as wireless radio already since almost 150 years, even on the international level, where of course, once one country would broadcast into another, that's an international activity, so that requires international regulation and international law. And the coordination of the international use of radio frequencies to avoid interference was picked up quite early. As a matter of fact, in, 19, in 1865, the International Telecommunication Union was established and it was one of the earliest global organizations. It has one of the most extended memberships of all intergovernmental organizations, covering almost every state in the world. And from the start, and of course, looking back at the date, that was ages before a satellite ever appeared on the horizon, both literally and as a matter of speech. Um, but it started dealing with these issues. The, the latest legal construct is based on the ITU constitution, um, which was drafted, redrafted in 1992 with the Convention on Radio Regulation. The main question that arose within a few years after Sputnik was, does this whole regime, which again for almost a century at the time was developed for terrestrial radio and terrestrial wired communication, is this also applicable to space frequency? Because that was not originally in the remit of the ITU. Well, luckily, smartly, 
the answer came quickly in 1959. It was agreed by all member states of the IQ that the answer is yes. So what then happens is that the ITU is able to apply a two or three step process to the use of frequencies with an international element. Uh, uh, that is of course a big pre uh, pre uh, prerequisite. If there would be a radio station in Orlando, Florida, which would have a range of only 200 miles, uh, no foreign country would be touched hardly any international waters would be touched. So regulating that also in terms of frequency use would remain the purely exclusive remit of the United States or within the US federal construct, the state of Florida. That's nothing that needs to concern the international business. But as soon as we talk about international use of frequency, we have this two or three step process, which starts with the allocation of frequency bands, which are ranges of frequencies, to specific types of services with international radio communications. I'm going to give you a little bit of an illustration soon to give you a little bit of a closer idea. It addresses the whole usable frequency spectrum for technical reasons, anything uh, more low frequency than 8.3 kilohertz and anything higher than three terahertz or whatever the amount is. Uh, is, is currently not feasible. And within that range, the whole process applies. And it basically works as follows. The frequency bands are indicated by the book ending frequencies. And what these frequency bands are allocated to is determined basically every four years, renegotiated in a huge, a giant uh, negotiation process of the World Radio Conferences, where all these member states and all the lobbyists and the private sector come together and try to discuss which frequency bands should be allocated to which type of services. If there is uh, a 5G development on the horizon in the United States and rich Western countries in Europe, they will try to push for more bandwidth, for more frequency spectrum to be allocated in the ITU context, which may go at the cost of other uh, services. So it's, it's, it's one huge negotiating process. But ultimately, every four years, uh, the result is a revision of the radio regulation, which provides hundreds of pages of information on the allocation of frequency bands. And just to give you a little bit of a flavor, this is a tiny part of, that, uh, of, the, of those allocations. So you see here the frequency range. You see here that uh, it is subdivided into further details. And then you see on top region one, region two, region three, the world is divided for, 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 for in terms of, of easiness to three different regions, the Americas, Europe and Africa, and Asia Pacific. Sometimes, as you can see here, the international allocations are the same across all three regions. But sometimes regions can have their own individual say. So this is kind of an effort to be as flexible as possible. You see here two types of two services have fixed and mobile, except aeronautical mobile. Those are the types of services that should seek for uh, the use of frequencies within the 7450 to 8100 kilohertz band. Or to give another example, uh, here you only see aeronautical mobile which is a different set of frequencies. You, see, you also see footnotes here, uh, which allow for further details, have these numbers 5.09, 5.110, et cetera, et cetera. They allow for different countries or groups of countries to yet again create a kind of an exception. So it's a very complex system of the effort to apply certain rules and allocations globally, but at the same time allow for as much frequency as is possible to allow every country, every region, every continent, its own application if it so wants. Now, within those frequency bands is where the second step takes place. And that's the allotment, and that's a term of art of specific frequencies to states for specific services. So what happens if, that, if SpaceX wants to develop a Starlink constellation, uh, its engineers develop an idea of we need this, that, and the other frequency. And then the US as the country of, of authority over Starlink has to ask for allotment of those 
frequencies requested by Starlink in this international process. And of course, the first thing the United States has to do, and if Starlink is smart, it has already done its homework and done it for the US, is check that if they, for example, want these frequencies for mobile communications, that they ask for frequencies in the frequency bands which are allocated for mobile uh, communications. Because if not, then it's thrown out right away because they're, in the, in, they're, they're aiming for the wrong set of frequencies. That's not all, of course, because once the allotment request is in, once the US has requested certain frequencies on behalf of Starlink, there is an enormous coordination process with all the other member states of the ITU, basically, who can come forward then and say, wait a minute, I have already a satellite operating at the same frequency in the same geographical area, and I'm the first comer. The first come, first serve rule is very important in space communications. So, sorry, Starlink, try and look for another satellite. And it might mean that the United States then has to tell Starlink, go back to the drawing board and come with some alternatives. At the end of the day, hopefully, frequencies will be, uh, will be uh, allotted, which can, uh, which have no one, which result in problems of interference with no one, and then they can be included in the master international frequency register. That looks something like this. You can look that up online, eh? Space Network Online. We're talking here about 2000 megahertz to 2200 megahertz. We're only talking about the geostationary orbit and uh, the long longitude. And here we see a process resulting of the French, F stands, stands for France, ESA stands for European Space Agency, which is an inter international European organization conducting space activities. Um, and since international organizations cannot independently ask for frequency, it has to ask the state where it's headquartered, in this case, France, to take up that task for it. Uh, the talk is about the Meteosat second generation satellite, MSG2. And you see that France then was, uh, was first in the, in the process and that the United Arab Emirates, which then came in with a request at the same longitude, for YASAT, which is an Arab uh, communication satellite, uh, of course was forced to go back to the drawing board because the French were first in line to get this, sorry, to get this, to get this uh, analysis. So YASAT had to come back later on with a second proposal, different frequencies. Now, again, I won't bother you too much with the details, but you can then click on view and then you get something like this, very complicated, uh, tables, which I won't go into detail, but here you see some of the advanced uh, uh, details thereof. The, the frequency, the bandwidth around the frequency. So you have a, uh, the, the frequency, which is 2,068 megahertz, but on both sides, half of 6,000 kilohertz, which is of course six megahertz, if you can still follow the calculations, is also reserved because if the frequencies are too close to each other, then there is still a risk of interference. So the, the, the approach of the ITU is to, to not only give you the exact frequency, the 2068 one, but also a little bit on both sides as a safety margin. That safety margin is here defined by way of six megahertz or six, 6,000 kilohertz, which means that between, between 2065 and 2071, you can actually freely operate. Here you have a different satellite with different numbers and so on and so forth. But I, I presume we get a little bit too much into the weed here to become, uh, not to become boring. So I, I will immediately move to the third step. Well, in case th that third step is only necessary in case the actual operator is a private operator, think about Starlink, or an intergovernmental organization, think about the European Space Agency. If the US federal government is requiring or requesting allotment for its own purposes, because the Department of Defense, no, that's the wrong example, because military communications are not subject to the ITU. If the State Department wants to use a frequency to set up a network with all the embassies over overseas, the allotment is the same as assignment, and there is no third step necessary. But if the actual operator, the intended operator, is Starlink or the European Space Agency, the state has then to assign the third step in the process that allotted frequency to the private operator. And then again, it will be included in the master international frequency register. 
Now, of course, there's much more to it. Uh, again, I, I, uh, you know, I leave it to questions if you're interested in going a little bit deeper. I want to spend a few words on a third regime which has recently come in, and that's trade law. If you realize that satellite communications is such a big business, you can imagine that most satellite operators want to have a global business. If you have a $100 million satellite up there already, which is basically, if it goes to the international geostationary orbit, capable of covering about a third of the world, you would rather have the, the, uh, the possibility, the acceptance of uh, all the countries in that so-called footprint, which is the area where you can receive the broadcast from the satellite, to actually do business there, to sell subscriptions there, to build up a customer base there. And that's where trade law comes in. The, the World Trade Organization in 1994 established, uh, together with the General Agreement on Trade and, Ser and Services, within a few years has come to uh, develop a broad level of global liberalization. So trade law, I, again, I don't want to go into the details, but the, under the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, since 1997, a massive liberalization of access to foreign markets for satellite communication services has arisen, which means that uh, a European operator, think Utosat or Inmarsat, can basically provide its services in the United States, of course, on the conditions of reciprocity that the United States operators such as Intelsat or Orionsat or Panamsat could provide services in, in Europe on basically the same, uh, the same uh, basic levels. So the uh, roughly 85% of global satellite communications is now subject to that trade liberalization regime, which obviously is a major part of the, the law that satellite communication operators need to know if they really want to make their business for us. There's still a number of, of, of states who have uh, certain limitations there. Uh, again, I won't not, don't want to go into too much detail, but this is basically the result of the fact that the ITU was very much technologically organized. It was uh, focused too much on uh, staying away from political issues, on, on addressing the engineering problems with interference and for finding operational procedures to avoid interference, as we briefly discussed. Um, so when the private sector in the 1980s and the 1990s grew and grew and grew and became more and more vocal about the interest in access to markets elsewhere, it was not the ITU which was able to pick this up, it was the WTO, because as you may know, the WTO and before it, the GATS, for decades, have been very active in trade liberalization, market liberalization in all sorts of markets, uh, of products, cars, bananas, radios, you name it, but also of services. So for them, it wasn't too much out of their comfort zone to also start addressing this. In 1985, the US already made a first step whereby the FCC, which is the Federal Communication Commission in the US responsible for taking care of telecommunications. This includes the, the, the role of the uh, United States in the context of the ITU. So the actual agency, which is going to go for allocation discussions and negotiations, which asks for a lot of is the FCC. The FCC also, uh, put a first milestone in the sand saying we need to work towards privatization of the sector. It's, it's not any more appropriate in these days to get the government, to get the taxpayer to finance these, uh, these very expensive telecommunications and satellite communication systems. We should push for uh, liberalization and privatization. Uh, nine years later in the European Union, a first piece of actual law was created whereby you, you see a sort of embryonic uh, free trade zone within the EU on services. So a Finnish telecom operator can now, provide, can now provide satellite services in Germany on the same basis as a German satellite operator, et cetera, et cetera. And that then pushed for this, oops, pushed for this fourth protocol, which provided, and I, I won't, don't want to go too much into the details, but which provided for uh, a large measure of liberalization 
satellite sources. So with that, I want to conclude and just leave you with one uh, somewhat self-serving message, namely that there is enough space out there for space lawyers. And there will be more and more space out there because obviously uh, we are only at the beginning in many respects of the development of private space, which still includes the ever-growing telecommunications sector. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm open to questions. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for that very interesting and informative lecture. Um, and, and great job for boiling down for us what I think is a very technical area so that it was um, digestible for us. Um, so I, I, as usual, have a few questions, but there were a few hands up before me. So I'm going to uh, go to the hands up. Paul, I think uh, we said you were first. So yeah, I, I put my hand up because I thought I was getting in line. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Yeah, I, I thought uh, that's what you were probably doing too. So no, I I uh, I was particularly interested in the slide that was up that showed the trade area, these various areas, and I I my question is where does the military fit in? Do they go through these procedures and regulations? Because uh, that's that's controversial and very uh, very much of concern to a lot of us. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm sorry, as a law professor, I have to say yes and no. Okay. Um, strictly, I went to speaking, <laughs> strictly speaking, these regimes do hardly or not at all apply to, to the military. The trade regime is clear. That's about commercial trade and, and whatever Department of Defense in the US, to take that example, buys or sells is not something that the WTO has anything to say about. In, uh, in space law, it's to some, it's to some degree different that the Outer Space Treaty, which I mentioned, has a few key principles on the limitations to military uses of outer space, which are legally acceptable. Uh, unfortunately, from one perspective, they don't go very far. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, there's only quite strict regulations when it comes to the moon and celestial bodies. They are basically demilitarized. But when it comes to the void of outer space, almost anything is possible. The only thing which is not possible is stationing weapons of mass destruction. Although I should add to that, that because of Article 3 of the Outer Space Treaty, which I briefly quoted, bringing in the UN Charter, we are still not entitled to use space as part of a war of aggression. But that's about where it stops. Um, and that, of course, has to do with the basic uh, element of international law consisting of treaties where individual states are willing to accept the obligations of those treaties and in particular when it comes to national security you can imagine states are very very careful because they accept limitations on their discretion to act as they see good if they are not very very certain that at least their potential opponents are limited even more to put it in very succinct yeah. terms right and when it comes to the itu there that's an interesting part because the itu has a particular article article 48 which says that the the, the military use of international radio frequencies does not require to go through the ITU process. So right. technically speaking, the Department of Defense can say, well, we like these frequencies, we'll, we'll yeah. go ahead anyway. Now, luckily, I would say the laws of physics don't distinguish between military and civil satellites. So if the, if the DOD would choose a frequency which someone else is already operating on who has obtained that frequency and through the diligence of the process of ITU, then again, both have white noise and also the military doesn't have white noise. So you can bet that the military is very closely following these processes and trying to pick its choices in terms of frequencies where yeah. they don't expect anyone else to operate yet. Yeah. But legally speaking, they're outside of the of the game. They're monitoring themselves, the exactly. military. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I think Richard, uh, you had your hand up, and then we'll go to the Oak Room. Okay, um, we had previously a discussion of uh, space junk, and with uh, more and more satellites. Uh, um, being shot up uh, uh, to provide internet service and communications, uh, we're getting more and more junk. And what I'm concerned about is the liability of this junk. Uh, uh, and the lawyers love for getting into a liability suit. Um, 
and we created a monster with um, that if space junk injures another operating satellite, the country uh, could be sued. Uh, that's uh, as well as the sponsor um, for damages. I'm just kind of concerned about, um, or is there an exemption for uh, junk uh, that causes liability in international space? Um, it, it, that, that's an interesting perspective because I, I have always tempted, uh, you know, tended to take the opposite perspective. I'm, I'm quite happy that uh, the liability regime is there because it at least requires states to do their best to prevent their own satellites from exploding and blowing up and causing all sorts of damage because, and that's the big if, that's my main concern. In many cases, of course, the big if is that you actually are able to, uh, to identify the state or states behind the, the, the junk. Um, if, if uh, you know, recently the, the Russians blew up their own satellite as part of training practice, uh, basically showing their muscles in outer space, threatening that, well, we can blow up our own satellites. So if you start a war with us, we can also blow up your satellite. Um, well, by that token, they created a lot of space junk. Uh, and if uh, parts of that, major parts of that, which two months after that have hit your satellite, you would probably still be able to prove that that piece of junk came from the targeted Russian satellite a couple of months ago, and you would be in business as far as your uh, compensation would be concerned. But if it's 10 years down the road, and or if the piece of junk is much smaller, and, and we shouldn't forget that a piece of junk as small as a paint flick can already pierce an astronaut's suit if he's doing a, a, a spacewalk. Uh, so they can, because of the speed at which they, they these paint flicks are traveling, can still be very dangerous. And of course, then we have a major problem in identifying the, 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 the liable state. So I'm happy that at least we have the liability convention and, and the article seven of the liability to uh, impose an onus on states to not allow, you know, the first idiot around the corner to do something in outer space because it's the state which is held on the hook. And that of course provides a huge incentive for that state to, uh, to make darn sure that only technically savvy operators can do up there if they're properly insured and things like that. It's far from ideal because again, uh, the, the, the real problem is identifying the space debris and, and the, the original owner. But at least it's, it's, the, it's the only thing we have really to, to, uh, to prevent states from thinking as they used to do, while well, space is so immense, who cares about us leaving a bit of junk? Which was one reason why in 1967, when this outer space treaty was drafted, we don't really have any international clause. We don't have any clause in there which limits or prohibits the production, the wanton production uh, of, of space debris, just because everybody thought, well, space is so big, you know, these few rockets which are shot there and a few satellites, who cares? Now we are in a different ball game and now we have to do something about it because if we don't do something about it relatively soon, we run the risk that no space activities at all are possible anymore. And human society has already become so dependent, not only for military purposes, but also for civil purposes and commercial purposes, that uh, you know, if we lose that capability, that would be a big blow. I I'll stop there. Well, we can talk for hours on this issue. Yeah. Well, and, and I guess it's only as good as you know whether states are willing to um, comply. You know, your example with Russia recently, which you know didn't seem like such a good idea, and I think resulted in members of the ISS. You know, basically taking cover, uh, right. including, by the way, two Russians. Yeah, and which also shows that space debris doesn't discriminate. So that's one reason why I'm seeing a glimmer of hope that everyone who has something at stake in space, even though they are as you know as antagonistic as Russia and the United States and perhaps China, there is at least a a certain common ground of thinking. Well, this problem can harm us all. Sorry for interrupting you, but. Julianne, do you want to, uh, we'll go to the Oak Room? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to thank you, um, Dr. Vonderdonk, for a fascinating lecture this afternoon. It's got me thinking. My question uh, for you has to do with what is the potential 
uh, for the weaponization of these radio frequencies and, and other signals um, such that uh, you know you could actually knock out for example GPS uh, which would mean that planes couldn't fly and ships couldn't go across the sea and all submarines would have to come to the surface. I mean, what is the potential for that? I mean, th th this all works as long as everyone plays nice, right? But everyone is not always going to play nice. No, no, you're absolutely right. And it's a great point. It's unfortunately a shortcoming of the, of the international regime. Um, for which there are many historical reasons which we don't need to go into, but the, the bottom line is indeed that if somebody really doesn't want to play nice, um, the only thing you can do is use the legal obligation and the fact that that state violated that legal obligation to, uh, to, to get general political sanctions going. Um, and, but unfortunately, the, you know, all states are equal, but some states are more equal than others. And, and the stronger as a state you are, the more you are able to get away with doing, you know, horrible things. I mean, think about what Russia is doing in Ukraine right now uh, without being properly sanctioned uh, or even put back in place. Um, what is happening in space so far is not anywhere near that, but the risk of jamming and, and or spoofing or hacking GPS and, 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 and other, uh, other genus S systems is certainly a major worry. And the, the, the general thinking currently in the sector is not so much to go for legal uh, uh, solutions, although it is of course very helpful if you are able, at least on a national level, to punish and criminalize these actions and, and just create a criminal law which says that everybody, everyone who's spoofing GPS or, or, or not a genus S system is liable, uh, you know, is, is criminally liable to, to, to years in jail or whatever. Uh, as a sidestep, uh, one of my consultancy jobs many years ago was a project of the European Union, which wants to promote Galileo, kind of the second generation genus s second generation version of gps but on a european version um, to promote it including trying to get the member states of the european union at least to criminalize any attacks like the ones you describe on the galileo system but in the international community unfortunately that is limited to national sanctions so at the international level the thinking is more like we need uh, to the extent we can to harness ourselves in, with all sorts of operational and technical devices against interference. And the other plain solution is simply, simply abundance. Uh, that if somebody harms one GPS receiver on an aircraft, uh, that there are others on different radio frequencies, which can immediately take over so that the risk that something bad happens, and of course, I'm describing it now a little bit in simplistic layman's terms, but if by, by, by creating these redundancies in the systems and the ability to switch quickly if something is a foul, the idea is that you can hopefully avoid most of these risky circumstances, but you can't really exclude it altogether, I'm afraid. Thank you. Bob, Bob, Bob go ahead. Bob Burstein. Who is the space cop that enforces these uh, regulations? I am the space cop, no, I'm joking. <laughs> There is no real space cup, but that's again part of what we generally see in international law, uh, that violations of international treaties, um, if, if there are smaller countries at stake, the sanctions which are available sometimes in the treaties or sometimes in the broader international community can suffice to kick such a country back in line or to punish it severely if, it, if it's not. But again, if you come to the major players, unfortunately, that doesn't help. Uh, and, and the only way you can use these, these, these violations is as a political argument for trying to convince that, uh, you know, the other state is apparently violating the rules of international law, is not trust, trustworthy, there can be boycotts and things like that. Um, there is no global police cop, and that applies to space as well. John X, go ahead. And don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, my question is a follow-up on the current situation in Russia. Uh, if, if Russians would 
be able to get a Russian version of, say, CNN, that would make Putin very unhappy, I believe, right? Now, what is he doing to prevent that? The only thing he can actually do to, well, it's two things. I mean, let's start with the baseline that the freedom of activity in outer space includes the possibility for US satellites like Starlink uh, promise to Ukraine, for example, to broadcast anything they want yeah. into Russian territory uh, because right. outer space is free. That's part of the basic freedom. So it's kind of the space equivalent of radio free Europe in the second world war. Uh, those of you who study history are, are familiar with that. Um, what Putin can do is basically two things. One of them is illegal, and that's trying to shoot down the, those satellites, um, because that is certainly a violation of international law. Whether it is an attack on a sovereign state is, is something else. Uh, what the appropriate retaliation, the legal, the legitimate retaliation would be is also something else, but at least that's illegal. Um, if he just jams the satellite or sort of blinds it, so that the broadcasts do not reach Russian territory. That's technically speaking already in violation of, uh, of international law because you're not supposed to interfere with these broadcasts, uh, presuming in my case that Starlink has properly gone through all the procedures in ITU, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but whether you can actually um, uh, identify and then take steps is another matter. I mean, a number of years ago, a Utilsat satellite was constantly uh, blinded by some someone operating on Ira Iranian territory, and the the sort of the suspicion was that it was actually the Iranian government, which didn't like these Western broadcasts to be uh, beamed to their Islamic population, and because they couldn't shoot it out of the sky and they couldn't prohibit Utilsat from broadcasting it, they simply decided to blind it. Uh, Iran always denied you know, uh, responsibilities that we can't find the source. And since you can't send in the troops into Iran to find out the source, you have to make do with that. And ultimately, Utilsat thought, well, you know, let's not let's not bother. We just switch to a different frequency and only serve the yes, our five. Show you something. Uh, I, I know you want me to sorry, sorry, someone is interrupting. <laughs> okay. um, so, and the thing which he, he can legally do, and that's the final part to, to your answer, is of course, A, prohibit uh, anyone on Russian territory to listen to these broadcasts, yeah. and B, impose heavy penalties upon them. And I'm reminded, even though I wasn't there myself, of, of the Nazi occupation of my country in the Second World War, when uh, the Dutch population wanted to listen to uh, Radio London to get the real news, but the Nazis didn't want that. And anyone in the Netherlands who would be caught listening to the radio could be shot on sight. So unfortunately, that is something about well, shooting on sight is, of course, going into uh, against certain human rights. But we've seen that Putin is not very much restrained by such considerations. But at least legally, he could say, well, it's prohibited. And because if you listen to the enemy, you know, we are entitled to throw you in jail for five years and, and they can send around constant constant you know people with listening devices seeing whether anyone has their dish you know uh, linking up to the starling uh, constellation in this example so that's kind of the scenario set of scenarios do, do, do you have any idea of, of what combination of those things he's actually using um, well i think already now the last one is is a matter of fact i mean you are already criminally liable if yeah. you listen in russia to news which by the uh, Russian uh, authorities is, is branded as anti-Russian, is as, as you know, de degrading the honor of the Russian army or whatever the terminology is. So that situation is already there. Uh, and, and I have no doubt that draconic measures are being imposed. Uh, you can be thrown into jail for, for months or years and the Russian jail is even less, uh, you know, uh, less nice than jails elsewhere. Uh, I haven't heard of any shooting so far. I'm sure that is not his major concern because also you generally get the impression that the, the, the years of massive state propaganda have resulted in a major part of the population simply believing that. So even if they would be confronted with CNN, they would still believe the Russian line, oh, these are liars, these are imperialists, they're trying to, to turn things upside down, they're all Nazis over there, et cetera, et cetera.
So before you have any, but that's of course another story. Yes, yes. Uh, um, technically, is it possible to, to jam it so effectively that, that uh, even if they wanted to listen to a Russian version of CNN, they could not do it? Well, it's not, it's not certainly not very easy. In the old days, it was easy because I, I briefly spoke about geostationary satellites in the geostationary or with 36,000 kilometers up. The, 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 the nice thing of those satellites and the term geostationary already indicates it is that the very special nature of that orbit means that satellites, they basically turn around the Earth in the same speed, uh, same angular rotation speed as the Earth turns. So from the Earth, they look stationary, which means they have to point their antenna only once, basically, and you have to point your antenna only once. So, of course, if you have a geostationary satellite on a more or less ge geostationary, uh, more or less stationary spot, it's relatively easy to blind. Now, Starlink is a hundred and soon a thousand, thousands of satellite constellations, small ones, tiny ones, more difficult to target, but also flying because at that altitude, they have to turn around the Earth much quicker than the Earth itself, because otherwise they are dragged down by gravity and, and the atmosphere. So the moment they come, they pick up a conversation, and they, by the time they start disappearing over the horizon, the next satellite is supposed to follow in the same orbit and take over that conversation, etc., etc. It's much more complicated. That's why it took decades for that technology to be, to be mature enough to be used commercially. But it also means that you constantly have to, to, to switch your, 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 your targeting, your jamming devices, if you really want to totally cancel that out. Well, I think I'm going to try and get in the last question or two here, um, Julianne, unless there's any, any other questions in the Oak Room. So I guess my question is a little more terrestrial. So you know, what do attorneys in this very specialized area um, find themselves doing uh, day to day? What, what are the, what are the, what sort of work are they most involved in? Well, to, 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 to start with, I think that there are very few attorneys in the real sense of the word who practice space law on a daily or even a regular basis. There are uh, a number of law firms who have specialists in space law, if you take satellite communications law or communications law more generally, of course, the, the group is already much larger. And when it comes to communications law, there are already from time to time actual court cases where they have to litigate, which is what an attorney normally does. So, but if you take the space law side, there are very few actual court cases or arbitral tribunal cases so far. That's gonna change with the ongoing privatization. I expect that to change over the next 10 years. But so far, there are very few of those. So the main occupations of all these lawyers is advising, advising on contracts between the satellite operator and the insurance company, between the satellite operator and his clients, uh, between the satellite operator and the licensing, whether well, that's not a contractual negotiation, but you can negotiate about the license and the requirements. Or on the other side of the fence, lawyers are needed in the regulatory agencies, not just in the US, but in other countries as well, to make sure that the regs are duly implemented. Um, you have a level higher those who actually make new regulations, whether they are in Congress or staffers of Congress or regulatory agencies or all the corollaries in other democratic or even non-democratic states. So there are a lot of governmental lawyers who think about that. Um, and, and there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of advice going on. Uh, much of my consultancy work is basically telling either governments who are interested in moving into space or the private sector to move into, to, into space. Well, these are the legal ramifications of what you can do and what you can do. So if you want to do this, better make sure that that, that, and that is, is, you know, taken good care of. Or maybe you should think about doing something else because the way you are approaching this is not uh, legally uh, applicable. Or you can advise them uh, in a procedural level how they could try to argue that the regulatory agencies come up with regulation that actually helps them. Uh, that's an ongoing, so, so in other words, to come back to your original question, there is, there's very few actual litigation going on. So it's much more in that advisory capacity, uh, legislating, regulation making, licensing making, et cetera, et cetera. And, and negotiating, of course, 
uh, the U.S. State Department has a couple of people, including uh, one of my star alums, who negotiate with everyone else about future international treaties or agreements, either on a bilateral basis or a multilateral basis. Okay, so so there haven't been any like major juicy fist fights between states, any big you know court cases or anything like that. So very few. Very few. Pretty amazing, uh, given how much. Uh, how much we have in space right now from you yeah. know all, all these different countries well, that all has to do with the government involved if, if sure. governments are involved they have other tools than going to court uh, they can negotiate they can exercise diplomatic pressure or even uh, less diplomatic pressure if you will if, if they really insist on something um, and since the world is still relatively small even the private sector uh, often tends to shy away from using the, the, the plain uh, judicial options because uh, they may want the contract next time. Yeah? They may have missed out on the contract this time and may be very unhappy about it, but they may, go, uh, if they may want to go for it next time and not antagonize anyone in that context. I mean, there are all sorts of these, but, but okay, let me stop there. Okay, I, and uh, I see Richard, you've got your hand up. So I think we'll make that the very last question since we've kept Dr. Vanderdunk on long enough. Um, although we could, uh, I, I'm sure, come up with many more questions for him. So Richard, uh, last question. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting discussions. Uh, uh, um, I'd like to go back to an incident uh, where um, a state um, decides that uh, the first thing in war is they're going to blow up the guy's um, uh, satellite that provides uh, GPS. Um, China has already alluded to this, that this will be their first action. And uh, the reaction um, in the United States was the Navy Academy, which gave up navigation by um, uh, astronomical means um, um, uh, uh, to use the electric me methods, which were much more precise than the sextant, um, has now instituted, reinstituted a course in navigation using sextant. Uh, because the first thing the Navy Academy thinks will happen is blowing up the uh, uh, satellite that provides uh, GPS to uh, weapons and uh, um, uh, enterprises and everything else with very precise decision. And Go ahead and get to your question if you don't mind, please. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> the so what was the question then? Whether that is what is being done about that legally? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's, that's another issue. Um, and, and the ultimate answer is probably not, not legally. I mean, um, I, 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 don't, I can't estimate how likely it is that that's going to happen. Uh, it's clear that if, they, if the Chinese or anyone else start shooting satellites out of the sky because they think there's a conflict or in preparation of a conflict, which is even worse, actually, because under the laws of armed conflict, you are possibly entitled to take out within limits you know, military uh, infrastructure of your opponent. But if you're not even at war, it is basically, you know, a no-go area, legally speaking. Um, the first question on the practical level then would be, uh, do they succeed in taking out all of GPS? Um, uh, there are currently 24 satellites. There are some spares. Um, there are backup means. Um, and what will the U.S. do in, in retaliation? Uh, the, the legal answer to that is because satellites are not territory that's part of the Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty, which I quoted early in my talk. Um, you can't argue that an attack on a satellite is an attack on the, uh, on the territorial integrity of your country. Um, that doesn't mean that, it's, uh, an, that you're entitled, that, that you, you, know, you simply have to, attack to accept an attack like that. Uh, it may be uh, uh, a threat to the political independence, which is the other uh, branch of the UN clause uh, allowing uh, someone to strike back in self-defense. Um, 
if it, 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 but that is probably hard to argue in the US as well, unless they take out all 24 satellites or at least the majority so that there is a serious uh, risk of, uh, of, of losing, of degrading, you know, lots of the operational capabilities, not just of the military, but also of hospitals and all sorts of civil, civil applications. Uh, another thing, and that brings me more, uh, a little bit more away from the legal realm, is, is the reality that the Chinese are now building their own uh, satellite navigation system, Beidou. Uh, the Russians have already have one, GLONASS. Europe is building one, India is building one, Japan is, is, is building one. Um, so, and, and the good side of that is of course that the United States, when something like that would ever happen, doesn't need to think, okay, what can I do in retaliation um, maybe I should bomb a Chinese ground station, which may directly put lives at risk. So is that proportional under the laws of armed conflict compared to a satellite or a bunch of satellites, which may be indirectly endanger US lives? They can simply say, well, you shut down one of our satellites, we're going to shut down one of yours. So the, 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 the interesting thing in that sense is that the more these countries have at stake in outer space, the less likely they are to risk a war like that. And uh, if you talk about taking out satellites, the physical taking out of satellites, we already discussed that creates space debris. Space debris doesn't discriminate. The Russian anti-satellite tests endanger two Russian uh, cosmonauts as well. If the Chinese start blowing up, whether it's their own satellite as they also did 12 years ago, or somebody else's satellite, uh, they will create space debris, which also endangers their own capability. So, uh, it is, it is too complex a situation for me to be uh, clear that that would be the first thing that the Chinese would target. But I, I'm not, a, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not in the information, in, in the intelligence uh, uh, community. So I, I really don't know. Uh, and again, <laughs> legally speaking, the only thing I can say is that these issues are now for the first time seriously on the table. So far, we've been lucky that nothing like that has even threatened to uh, closely threatened to happen. So um, me and my colleagues, both from the University of Nebraska, but also from some other universities, as well as from uh, some armed forces, including, of course, the US Armed Force, are discussing a manual on how the laws of armed conflict would or could or should apply to a space context. Inter alia addressing the question that, that, that you provide, to which there is no clear answer for you could say the fortunate reason that so far we never had to think about one but since that is gradually changing unfortunately we now better start thinking about one so maybe a few years from now we have a first comprehensive analysis of what risks are reasonable in terms of use of armed force in outer space including an example like yours and along what lines should the victimized states then think about retaliating and uh, keeping general principles of, of the law of armed conflict as applicable in, 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 uh, in, in mind. That, that, that effort is, uh, is called the Woomera Manual. So if you're really interested in that, you might wish to follow that. Uh, in a couple of years, it's supposed to be, uh, to be finalized. Yeah, I did see that online, actually, so good to, good to hear that. Well, I think on that note, um, we will say um, thank you very much to uh, Professor Vanderdonk. A very interesting lecture. Uh, very much appreciate your time with us here today and being willing to stay and uh, answer a few extra questions than uh, I think we normally go through. So that just is uh, telling us, everybody, how uh, great a job you did. So always a good sign. <laughs> My pleasure. Right. Thank you very much. So, and then everybody stay tuned in for next week. We're going to talk about the last generation of lonely astronomers. So uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. Take care, everyone. And thank you again, Dr. Vonderdonk. Bye-bye. Bye now.